Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Today we're gonna have a series of talks from trainees in Dr. Marcel Lepage's lab at the Douglas. Our first speaker, Agnès Belkacem, is a PhD student in cognitive neuroscience at the Department of Psychology at McGill. She completed her bachelor's degree in psychology at the University of Ottawa. And today she'll speak to us about her current research on brain and memory changes following antipsychotic treatment in patients experiencing a first episode of psychosis. Um, thank you, Cathy, for this great presentation. Um, so hello, my name is Agnes. I'm going to present today my our longitudinal study, where it's the first episode of psychosis patient, also known as FAB patients. So we'll start with some background. We know that the hippocampus plays a crucial role in memory processes, as demonstrated by the case of HM, who suffered from epilepsy and developed enterograd amnesia following temporal lobe resection. And so since this discovery, there has been considerable evidence to support that the hippocampus is quite dysfunctional in schizophrenia, but also in first steps of psychosis. In addition to that, it contributes to the widespread memory impairments associated with the disease. At the moment, it remains uncertain when these structural changes occur in the brain. However, research conducted in individuals at high risk for developing psychosis has revealed that those significant brain abnormalities when compared to control are showed in the presence of brain changes before the first episode of psychosis. And so we see that in this figure, um, when FAB patients are compared to controls, there is a significant difference in both left and right hippocampal volumes, with patients showing reduced volumes. In addition to that, a hemispheric effect seems to exist, reporting a more pronounced decrease than left hippocampal volume, which has, has been well documented in several studies. And so despite of the presence of many other symptoms, such as positive symptoms and negative symptoms, cognitive deficits have the most impact on daily functioning and nearly 70% of patients of schiz uh, with schizophrenia have cognitive deficits. In addition to that, we know that the structure of the hippocampus is highly related to cognition particularly to verbal memory, which is significantly impaired in psychosis and also represent an important predictor of the functional outcome. And so given what we know, this raises the question, why study first episode patients? And so studying first episode patient is important in understanding the structural changes that occur uh, in the brain because it's still possible at that stage of the disease to study patient who have uh, had very little exposure to medication, which allows us to exude the possibility that the medication alters the structure of the brain and therefore the cognitive function. You can see that in this figure, there's a difference in the volumes of the hippocampus in its subfields uh, before and after acute antipsychotic treatment and that seen in schizophrenic patients. So we know that in type psychotics help reduce the positive symptoms of psychosis, but they have only a limited impact on cognitive deficits. But they also have been associated with significant structural abnormalities in the brain. In this figure, we can see that Yang and colleagues found a significant negative correlation between antipsychotic dosage and hippocampal volume. In addition to that, a recent cross-sectional study by Ballesteros and colleagues in 2018 found that deficits in verbal memory was associated with a high antipsychotic dosage, meaning that uh, perhaps increased doses of antipsychotic medication was associated with increased cognitive deficits perhaps suggesting overtreatment of fat patient in the early stages of the disease. And so given that antipsychotics are not as effective in treating cognitive deficits, the research suggests that anticholinergic burden of antipsychotics, which is the overall effect of medication that have anticholinergic properties, should be considered as it is associated with verbal memory deficits which again are the, the most consistently reported deficits in patients with a first episode. 
However, the rationale for such a focus on medication with anticholinergic and sedative properties, it's that studies suggest that patients with schizophrenia show initially a decrease in central cholinergic activity and their decrease in muscarinic receptors. Therefore, the addition of highly anticholinergic medication may saturate those muscarinic receptors and therefore affecting cognitive and verbal learning. Muscarinic receptor blockade is suggested to be an important mechanism of action that may disrupt cognition in schizophrenia. So knowing all this, we aim to examine changes in verbal memory performance um, in patient compared to control, but also to examine changes in hippocampus cell fill volumes. Uh, again, patient compared to control over time. But we also wanted to determine to the extent of which antipsychotic treatment may explain some of the changes over time. So we have first hypothesized that patient would have a poor verbal memory performance and a reduced hippocampal cephal volumes over time when they're compared to controls. Regarding medication, we expected anticholinergic to be uh, anticholinergic. Um, and psychotic dosage to be negatively associated with subfields, especially those with denser dopaminergic receptors, such as the Delta gyrus. We also expected uh, that anticholinergic burden to be negatively associated with cognition, particularly with verbal memory, uh, which again is the most consistently reported deficits in FEP. Moving on to the method to answer our research question, we examined FAP patients who were also followed by the PEP Montreal Clinic, and we also followed non-clinical controls. And all participants completed a 3T MRI and an oral cognitive test at three, nine, 12, and 18 months after admission. We also considered three months after admission as baseline. In addition to that, at baseline, we collected antipsychotic dosage and anticholinergic burden. In order to test differences between controls and patients over time, the generalized estimation equation, also known as the GE model, was used. And it's a generalized linear model that allows us to perform a repeated measure analysis with nested and not necessarily normal data. And the main advantages of this approach is that no distributional assumption needs to be respected and it does not necessarily require a balanced set, therefore helping us uh, dealing with missing values. And of course, to, of course, to test association between change in time in verbal memory performance and in hippocampal subfield volumes, correlations were performed. Regarding medication, antipsychotic dosage has been measured using the chlorpromazine equivalent doses, which is a measure of equivalence between antipsychotics, making it possible to compare their doses, efficacy, and effect on dopamine receptors. It is also known as uh, a dose of the drug in question that is equivalent to 100 milligram of chlorpromazine. Regarding the anticholinergic burden of antipsychotics, um, it was calculated using the drug burden index, also known as the DBI, which is a measure to quantify exposure to medication with anticholinergic and sedative properties. And so when the score is greater than one, it's usually considered that the exposure to anticholinergic effects is considered as high. And so consistent with our hypothesis, uh, the GE analysis revealed a reduced hippocampal volume in patient compared to control over time, so from baseline to 18 months. And our results also suggested a poor verbal memory performance, again, in patient compared to control over time. And so after obtaining significant interaction, some contrast analysis was performed to give us more information about those results. For example, for verbal memory performance at each time point, uh, when we compare patient with control, there's always a significant difference with patient showing poor verbal memory. We also notice that's the most significant difference in performance uh, in uh, verbal memory 
in, comp in comparison to the baseline performance was at 12 months of follow-up and that with inpatient. Regarding medication, we found four significant negative correlation between medication and subfields uh, volumes. And so those correlations were found for change in volume in left A1, left antigyrus, left fimbria, and left hippocampus. And the change was from baseline to 18 months and the medication um, and used in this, uh, those correlation was the antipsychotic dosage. And finally, we found a significant negative correlation between the anticholinergic burden and change from baseline to 12 months in verbal memory performance. And so from that study, we can understand that uh, despite the effectiveness of antipsychotics in relieving psychotic symptoms, it appears that maybe over the long term and at high doses, they may not necessarily um, prevent the progressive brain changes that occur with the disease, and they have a detrimental effect on cognitive performance. Of course, larger neuroimaging studies with a longer follow-up period may be useful in better understanding the long-term effects of antipsychotics in the brain. Uh, in addition to that, a greater clinical consideration of anticholinergic burden of antipsychotics should be addressed in psychiatric patients. But more importantly, since cognitive deficits and those brain volume changes appear to be present in the early stages of the disease, um, it would be useful to remind and raise awareness among professionals of the potential long-term effect of medication in the first episode of psychosis. Of course, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Martin Lepage, Cathy, Delphine, and Karen for helping me and assisting me during this project, as well as the entire Chris Lab team. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Agnes. We have a couple of questions, um, but we'll hold them for the end. So uh, next up is Marianne Carrillo. She is um, a master's student at McGill. She acquired a bachelor's degree in neuroscience um, at McGill under the supervision of Dr. Kristen Kautzik. And she was recently awarded a CIHR Canada Graduate Scholarship. Today, she will present a systematic review and meta-analysis on brain structural correlates of cognitive function in schizophrenia, which is part of her master's thesis. Thank you, Katie. So yeah, hello everyone. Today I'm going to present to you the results of my meta-analysis about brain structural correlates of cognitive function in schizophrenia. This work is currently under review for publication. So cognitive deficits have been described as strong predictors of functional outcomes in schizophrenia, preceding the onset of psychosis and not remediated by current medication. To characterize the cognitive domains impacted by schizophrenia that could improve with interventions, studies have identified seven severely impaired domains. Over year, the years, several studies have also investigated the underlying neurobiology of schizophrenia and have consistently shown an overall cortical decrease in gray matter volume compared to healthy control, especially in the frontal, temporal, and subcortical structures. Research focusing on surface area and cortical thickness, which together constitute brain volume, have found widespread cortical thinning and reduced surface area of most cortical regions in schizophrenia. The structural brain changes in certain regions observed in schizophrenia have been shown in multiple studies to correlate with the cognitive degradation observed in patients. However, the widespread morphological changes in brain structures associated with cognitive deficits could point to fundamental structural alterations in large-scale brain regions. It is becoming increasingly recognized that Schizophrenia may be due to disruptions of integrated networks of brain regions rather than to damage in specific areas. So the extensive morphometric changes in schizophrenic brains combined with the interactions of several regions for complex cognitive functions reinforces the need to shift from regional to large scale brain networks in structural studies. Although a structural network topography is still lacking, 
The seven functionally derived brain networks by Yeo and Al have been used in structural studies. Now these networks are the default mode network active during rest considered to be the default setting of the brain, the dorsal attentional network for externally directed attention for tasks, ventral attention network for attention to salient internal stimuli but also involuntary action, the frontoparietal control network for goal-directed executive control, the somatomotor network responsible for motor movements and somatic sensation, the limbic network for emotions and affect, and the visual network, which groups regions responsible for vision and the direction in space. A growing body of the literature is thus using the architecture of these brain networks to investigate the structural abnormalities in psychiatric disorders, as well as associations between the clinical and anatomical dimensions of schizophrenia. Now, the purpose of our study was twofold. We first wanted to conduct a quantitative synthesis of the current literature on brain structures and cognition in schizophrenia. Then we wanted to examine whether brain structure cognition associations could be better explained in terms of network topography using Yeo and Al. To do that, we started with a systematic literature search. The retrieved articles were screened according to three inclusion criteria and we assessed inter and intra readers reliability for the article selection process. Then the included articles were examined to extract the relevant information for the meta-analysis. Cognitive tests were categorized into eight domains derived from the matrix cognitive domains, and these were speed of processing, attention and vigilance, working memory, verbal learning and memory, visual learning and memory, reasoning and executive functions, social cognition, as well as verbal fluency. We also assess, based on predetermined criteria, the quality of the studies. We then performed eight overall meta-analyses of the correlation between all reported structures and each of the domains. So we assessed publication bias and heterogeneity at this level. Following the overall meta-analyses, we performed two subgroup analyses for each of the eight domains to determine if there's a significance in correlation between the low and high quality studies. Then we use the brain atlases in articles to identify reported regions and categorize them into networks if possible. Studies that reported regions on larger brain areas, like for example, the temporal lobe or unclassified structures like the white matter, ventricles, or any brainstem nuclei were excluded from the network meta-analyses for the exception of three regions, the amygdala, cerebellum, and hippocampus, which have shown important associations with cognition and were thus investigated. We controlled for multiple comparisons with the FDR correction at the network and other structures level. And for significant network cognition associations, we also looked at which brain regions drove this relationship. Now, our systematic literature search resulted in 7,261 articles, 115 of which were included in the systematic review and 88 in the meta-analysis. For the article selection process, now there was a significant association between all overall brain metrics and all eight domains, as we can see in the first plot below. The uh, S column represents the number of studies that had a correlation with the domain and all the brain regions. C is the number of correlation and N is the total patient sample size. The largest associations were usually the ones with the most studies reflecting more knowledge on structural regions than other domains. We further examined this exceptionally strong association observed with social cognition relative to other domains by dividing this domain into the two most studied subcategories, emotional processing and theory of mind, based on the type of task reported. Although they showed significant correlations with the brain structures individually, there was no significant difference between the two subdomains. For publication bias, one of the two tests we used indicated potential publication bias for reasoning and executive function, social cognition, and verbal fluency. We thus have to acknowledge that partiality in the literature might impact our results for these domains. We found significant heterogeneity for all domains as expected due to the variability of the methodologies across studies and our inclusion of multiple metrics and brain regions. 
And finally, we showed that for all but variable memory, there was some difference between the low and the high quality study. Now, leveraging the functional brain network topography provided new insights concerning the structure cognition association in schizophrenia. Here in the middle, we present the overall significant correlations between cognitive domains and brain networks. Then for each cognitive domain, the gray links are non-significant correlations, the colored links are the significant ones, and a lack of link means that there was no correlation in the literature. Speed of processing was associated with significantly with three networks. Due to a high overlap between tasks used to assess attention and speed of processing, we are not surprised to observe significance in the attentional network. However, the significant correlation with the default mode network was unexpected and was driven by the inferior temporal gyrus, a region known for its symbolic number processing function, which is necessary for speed of processing tasks. Attention and vigilance uh, was found to be significantly correlated only with the somatomotor network driven by Heschel's gyrus, likely due to several studies using auditory continuous performance tests to assess attention. The dorsal attention network showed a non-significant correlation and no studies reported any correlation with the ventral attentional network, which was unexpected. Working memory was associated significantly with three networks, the dorsal attentional network driven by the inferior frontal gyrus opercularis, the somatomotor driven by the superior temporal gyrus, and the ventral attentional network by the superior frontal gyrus. This emergence of attentional networks is not unexpected, given that most tasks assessing working memory require goal and stimulus-directed processing, and the association of working memory with other domains, like speed of processing, attention, and verbal fluency, also showed strong associations with these networks. Now, verbal learning and memory was correlated significantly with the frontal parietal network, driven by the dorsal lateral and middle frontal gyrus, and the ventral attentional network driven by the superior frontal gyrus. We expected the limbic network to be significant because it includes brain regions like the parahippocampus and the interrhinal cortex, which are input and output regions for the hippocampus central of declarative memory. Visual learning and memory was significantly associated with the visual network as expected and was driven by the fusiform gyrus and was also significantly correlated with the frontal parietal network driven by the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Previous reviews pointed to the prefrontal cortex as a processing and integration area for visual information. Reasoning and executive function was significantly associated with all of the brain networks. The widespread brain regions associated with the domain, the different processes engaged during reasoning and executive function tasks, and the relation of this domain with other domains of cognition have all been reported in the literature. Social cognition was also significantly associated with all the brain networks. The extensive structural abnormalities were expected as previous reviews and studies have identified multiple subdomains and structures involved in social cognition. And finally, verbal fluency was only correlated significantly with the default mode network, driven by the inferior temporal gyrus, which is known for its function in auditory and speech processing. Although we expected the dorsal and ventral attentional network and the somatomotor network to be associated with verbal fluency due to its strong relation to other domains like speed of processing and attention, it was not the case because of a small number of correlations in the literature. Now, although not categorized in cortical networks, the amygdala, hippocampus, and cerebellum also showed a diffuse connectivity with the most of the cognitive domains, more evidence of the utility of using networks in structural studies. The amygdala, important for emotional tagging of memories, has been significantly correlated with four domains. It was not correlated with the verbal memory and visual memory domains because of the lack of general absence of the emotional content in the tasks typically used to assess verbal and visual memory. The cerebellum, recently known for its integrative processing function, has shown the largest significant association with working memory as expected, but also visual memory. And the hippocampus, as expected, was significantly correlated with all memory domains, as well as speed of processing, reasoning, executive function, and social cognition in a very large part. This can be explained by the need of retrieving previous social situations for future social interaction. 
Now the strongest overall brain cognition associations were with speed of processing, verbal memory, visual memory, reasoning, executive function, and social cognition. These domains are also uh, with the most associated studies, which might reflect research trends in the field or more knowledge about them. Overall, we observed that associations between brain structure and cognition can be understood in terms of brain network architecture and key brain regions. Robust widespread structural changes in schizophrenia were associated with different cognitive domains and highly connected regions within networks correlated with specific domains. Some limitation to this study include the diluted summary effects when combining multiple studies with different methodologies and the exclusion of some regions in subgroup analyses. Now, although we looked at structure within networks, investigating the connectivity and the between network associations could be equally, if not more important, given the overlap between cognitive domains and associated brain networks. Additionally, future studies should focus on determining which of cortical thickness or surface area drives the volumetric changes that is robustly reported in the literature. And more research in this area is also necessary with the first episode psychosis or at-risk populations, which would provide a deeper understanding of the neurodevelopmental aspect of the disorder. I want to end by thanking my co-authors and collaborators on the project, as well as all the members of my lab. And thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Marianne. So we'll move on to our last set of speakers. Um, our final presentation will be jointly led by Olivier Percy Tissard and Delphine rocher chenet Olivier is a PhD student in neuroscience at McGill University under the supervision of Dr. Martin Lepage and Dr. Ashok Mala. Um, Delphine works as a psychiatrist at the University Hospital of Reims in France. She completed her French medical degree in psychiatry in 2010 and a PhD in psychology in 2018. And she was a postdoctoral fellow in our lab until very recently. Uh, so they'll be presenting on a meta-analysis of cerebral blood flow in schizophrenia, as well as the development of a neuroimaging protocol here at the Douglas. Hi everyone. So, um, like I said, uh, with Delphine, we'll be talking about uh, cerebral blood flow in schizophrenia, and more specifically, the differences there is uh, in comparison to healthy controls and uh, the relationship with clinical symptoms. We will be presenting the results from uh, our systematic review and meta-analysis, and uh, that we conducted on the topic and the protocol uh, of our own perfusion uh, imaging study, informed by that uh, systematic review. Yeah, this, we start with a small reminder about schizophrenia. So it affects up to 3% of the population and uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders are combined by prominent functional impairments and is a, um, well, comprise uh, four to five key symptoms dimensions that, that you might all know, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive impairment, as Mayan just described really well, and also affective symptoms are usually divided into mania and depression. MRI, through its various modalities, has tentatively characterized neurobiological correlates of schizophrenia and continues providing new insight into the pathophysiology of this disorder with modified brain morphometrics and activations over the course of illness and in relation to the symptomatology. But the idea that schizophrenia is a direct result from solely defects in neuronal population and networks is changing. The coupling between neural activity and cerebral blood flow achieved by the neurovascular unit, which embodied a unique relationship between neural activity and cerebral blood flow, well, as I said, <laughs> might be altered and contribute to the development of schizophrenia. So another interesting approach to understand the pathophysiology of schizophrenia consists in the analysis of its hemodynamic correlates. And several studies have implicated blood vessel pathologies and blood flow changes in mental health disorders. The cerebral blood flow is a measure of volume of blood per unit of time, normally quoted in millimeters per minute. In schizophrenia, abnormal distribution of regional CBF was originally shown in PET and SPECT studies. It started from the 70s and the hypofrontality concept with reduced perfusion in the frontal area emerge from this technique. 
But will these techniques provide many of the findings that are key to a contemporary understanding of brain perfusion? They are limited by their reliance on radioisotope and consequent radiation exposure. So today, perfusion MRI methods are used, and two of the most common ones are dynamic susceptibility contrast, which advantages are its clinical utility with a large variety of measures, but this method remains invasive, sensitive to signal loss, and requires consensus for absolute quantification of perfusion. The second one is arterial spin labeling, which is non-invasive and offers the ability to explore more broadly clinical populations. For example, during the last few years, ASL has become so increasingly accessible and gained in popularity that more than 400 new publications per year were reported on PubMed during the last five years. So the technique relies upon a relatively simple modification to a standard MRI acquisition. Before the acquisition of the brain image, blood in the neck is converted into an endogenous MR tracer by the process of magnetic inversion of the hydrogen nuclei in water, commonly called labeling. After a delay period, this allows for blood to flow into the brain where it accumulates within the tissue by crossing from the blood into cell and the extracellular space. The image acquired after the delay thus contains information about the delivery of the tracer to the tissue. By comparing with a control image in which no labeling has been done, an image of perfusion can be obtained. So if we look at the literature uh, on CBF with ASL techniques in schizophrenia, there's a first qualitative review that was published in 2016 on 10 ASL studies, and a really recent meta-analysis was conducted on 18 studies exploring both CBF and glucose metabolism. This expansion of a well-suited method to explore perfusion in clinical populations added to the emerging concept of neurovascular unit invited us to explore this further in schizophrenia. So first, we conducted an updated systematic review of MRI-based perfusion studies exploring regional CBF across the stages of schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Um, so we performed a systematic search of MBase, Medlines, and Sankarifo on OVID. Uh, studies were eligible for inclusion if they included uh, people with schizophrenia spectrum disorder compared to healthy controls using MRI-based uh, perfusion matching methods such as ASL or DSC uh, and uh, to investigate uh, cerebral blood flow. Among the, 60, uh, 50, the 653 retrieved records, 38 were included in the systematic review, of which 70 17 could be meta-analyzed. We excluded from the uh, meta-analysis studies which did not uh, conduct whole brain analysis of CBF, uh, or studies that uh, subgrouped uh, their sample and therefore had no single uh, contrast schizophrenia versus healthy controls. We also assessed the methodological quality included of included studies, calculating a risk of bias uh, score uh, based on participant selection image acquisition, pre-processing, and statistical analysis. <clears throat> to uh, quantify vocal-wise differences in resting state, uh, regional cerebral blood flow between enduring schizophrenia and healthy control, we conducted a meta-analysis using seed-based demapping. Overall, 70 studies could be an, uh, meta-analyzed, meta including 622 uh, patients and 606 controls. Cluster of hypoperfusion were uh, identified in five cortical regions the left entire cingulate, the left middle frontal gyrus, the left insula, and the bilateral middle uh, occipital. Cluster of hyperperfusion, however, were observed in two subcortical regions the bilateral, um, nuclear, the bilateral lenticular nucleus of the putamen. However, only two clusters of hypoperfusion. Uh, survived FWE correction, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex and the middle frontal gyrus, of which um, both were greatly reduced uh, in size. So it seems there is a contrast between hypoperfused cortical region and hyperperfused uh, subcortical region. This is consistent with results found uh, in other modalities as alterations of CBF 
uh, since this review have also been reported in the same brain regions reported as altered in structural and functional image. Our results also highlight specific patterns of regional cerebral blood flow in schizophrenia compared to healthy controls and suggest that CBF is indeed a valid and reliable uh, neuromatic marker for investigating the physiopathological correlates of uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorder. So our meta-analysis provided overall further support for the concept of hypofrontality, initially reported with PET and SPEC neuromatching, and confirmed results from uh, previous meta-analysis with hypoperfusion mostly uh, observed in frontal regions. However, our finding also suggests suggest some subcortical hyperperfusion in line with uh, the, do the, dopamine the dopaminergic hypothesis of schizophrenia and also improves the regional brain localization of cerebral flow alteration. Unfortunately, uh, the diversity of scale used and the small number of studies reporting results uh, for correlation between symptoms and cerebral blood flow um, prevented us to conduct a meta-regression. However, seven studies did report a significant correlation with psychotic symptoms. It appears that increased severity of positive symptoms was associated with increased cerebral blood flow, such as, such as studies mostly um, reported positive correlation. Notably, the severity of positive symptoms was positively correlated with uh, regional cerebral blood flow in uh, subcortical regions found to be hyperperfused in our meta analysis such as the pitamine. In contrast, severity of negative symptoms uh, was associated uh, with decreased uh, cerebral blood flow as showed by negative correlations mostly. Most recently, with results from our own meta-analysis, negative symptoms were found to be negatively correlated with cerebral blood flow in regions also demonstrating uh, decreased perfusion, uh, notably in the middle frontal gyrus the anterior cingulate cortex and the middle occipital gyrus. So interestingly, uh, there is an overlap between the frontolimbic uh, and temporal region identified here and the neural correlates found to be associated with some cognitive function, with some cognitive and functional impairments. So this review uh, provides further evidence that specific regional alter alteration of cerebral blood flow are related to different dimensions of symptoms but further studies are uh, required in clinically homogeneous subgroup of patients to specifically uh, identify regional cerebral blood flow and um, <clears throat> So finally, our review highlighted some research gap in the iterators that we sought to address. So for instance, only one study examined cerebral, uh, cerebrovascular reactivity with an hypercapnia challenge, and only two studies uh, use the cognitive, uh, cognitive task during acquisition to examine neurovascular coupling. So there is clearly a need for increased use of vasoactive stimuli to offer a dynamic uh, picture of cerebral blood flow regulation. Also, considering the poor localization of uh, regional cerebral blood flow alteration underlying psychotic symptoms, uh, further studies specifically focusing on negative symptoms and positive symptoms will help to uh, delineate more confidently regions with altered perfusion in association to uh, symptomatology. This led us to conduct our own perfusion imaging uh, study, which we will now present as a PERFEP10 uh, protocol. So we will, in this study, we'll be uh, conducting in clinical homogeneous subgroup of patients to specifically identify regional cerebral blood flow alteration associated with negative symptoms. We expect that uh, hypoperfusion will be found in frontolabic uh, regions and that the relationships uh, with, negative with negative symptoms will be uh, severely dependent. As the exploration of uh, cerebral blood flow can be uh, both at rest or in response to vasoactive stimuli, uh, we chose to combine both approaches uh, to provide information on cerebral blood flow and its uh, regulation through neurovascular coupling and uh, cerebrovascular reactivity. To do so, we will use a cognitive task and uh, hypercapnia manipulation, and we expect to find uh, hypoactivation in, re in response to the task and impaired other reactivity in response to the uh, hypercapnia challenge. That could both be dependent uh, on negative symptoms uh, selected. 
Um, the recruitment for the study will be based on prior trajectory analysis applied to a cohort of FEP patients uh, from the PEP here at the Douglas, uh, who are currently undergoing a 10 year follow up assessment. We already use a data driven approach for identifying homogeneous subgroups uh, of patients who share similar longitudinal uh, trajectory within a uh, heterogeneous larger population. And we found that uh, three trajectories were elected. A remitting trajectory in blue, characterized by a rapid decrease in negative symptoms, improving past uh, the cutoff value for remission. An improving trajectory in uh, yellow, uh, showing improvement following initiation of the treatment at a moderate level. And uh, in uh, red, a uh, stable trajectory characterized by uh, severe negative symptoms uh, throughout the entire follow up. So for the functional uh, CBF part, the task used will be the, the semantic memory encoding task uh, created by Guimon and collaborators in the lab. Pairs of items will be presented and participants will have to remember each pair of objects and which objects were put together. The task is to determine which object of the pair is bigger in real life. There are two conditions, as you can see, semantically related or unrelated items. So this task was chosen as it elicited in a previous fMRI study, uh, modified frontal temporal activation in schizophrenia patients when compared to controls. For example, here you have that in the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, in the left superior parietal lobe, and in the inferior temporal gyrus. Then the cerebrovascular reactivity will be tested through an hypocapnia challenge. So the experiment will be conducted with the help of MRI compatible breathing circuits. The TTL signal will be sent to a software built by Record Steam that controls the gas delivery through a respiratory gas analyzer. This gas analyzer will also collect the outputs like the expired CO2 concentration and send this to the software that combines the data with the physiological trace. So for now, we already started the recruitment of pilots and check with the colleagues experts in the ASL the validity of the collected scan. So that's uh, all we have for now, but uh, we're happy to discuss this with you. I would like to thank, of course, all the Chris Lab and uh, Martin Lepage team, but also Claudine Gauthier and her team at the Concordia, Mala Chakrati and the CIC team and record and prevent AD team for the material for the upper Katnia challenge. Thank you. Thanks, Sergei. So um, there were some questions in the chat. I would invite you to continue asking your questions and I'll kind of go through from the start. Um, this question is for Agnes. Uh, Nadia asks, is medication based on self-reported measurements or can you check via some type of blood test? Yeah, so um, the medication was not checked through like a blood test. It was reported according to um, what the doctor prescribed and what the patient recalled to have taken. Uh, but in terms of like the measurement of medication, it was a calculation calculation using the daily dose uh, mainly. Nadia, uh, do you want to follow up on that, I guess? Yeah. How, how, how often does it? Yeah, just type your question. Uh, she, um, Nadia also asked on behalf of Aurelie, um, how do they know that it is linked to medication and not caused by the fact that higher medication is given to people with worse symptoms? Yeah, so like that's like the main question, right? It's a, it's a really good question. And we basically try to distinguish, distinguish those two. Um, it is really difficult to do that. Uh, but if we compare chronic uh, schizophrenic patient to fat patient, they already differ and a lot in duration of illness and severity of illness. So studying FELP can help in that. Um, I know there is a study that was done in 2011. I think they tried to uh, 
isolate the antipsychotic effect on brain volume uh, with ad adding covariants such as illness severity, duration of illness, substance abuse, and they were able um, to see an effect. But um, yeah, so like they, they stated that main, even if they added those covariants, it's difficult to separate this and distinguish the effect of antipsychotics uh, versus the illness Antipsychotics are believed to be by illness severity. Um, yeah, but of course, like studies finding poor, like regarding cognition, studies finding uh, poor performance in uh, cognition had usually patient taking larger doses and um, first generation antipsychotics. Thanks. Uh, Nadia just um, wrote her question that follows up on the first one. How often does it happen for people to falsely self-report their medication uh, dosage, like, or to secretly stop taking them due to side effects, for example? Yeah. Just trying to get at the idea of whether that self-report is a valid um, measure. Yeah. And accurate. That's a, that's a good question. Probably a limitation of my study is that, like, of course, there's, like, non-compliance and, um, we did measure the other adherence, which was pretty okay in our demographics. Um, I could show you that if you want to look into that more specifically, but yeah, I would say that it's difficult to see. Yeah. And to like, because I did a calculation and we, I used a uh, scale that takes into account the daily dose. It's, already helping us um, putting a number into that exposure. Uh, but usually researchers use just like uh, scales that uh, range the effect of zero to three, zero being um, a lower effect and three being a high effect. But in this study, we really, we really wanted to quantify this effect. So that may help, but of course it's a future direction. Um, Lena had asked a question. I don't know if he's still here, if you want to, um, or had made a comment. Um, if he's still around, he can um, raise his hand and, and maybe make it. So it's uh, quite a long one. I don't want to read it all out. Um, but anyways, I suggest you uh, take a look and he talks about some, some different uh, research that he had uh, seen on the topic. Uh, Lori, I believe you have a question. I had raised your hand um, earlier. Would you like to ask your question? No, I think my question was answered uh, for Agnes, okay. but I was just wondering for the uh, for the meta analysis if they could have included uh, O15 PET studies as well. Right, for Olivier, uh, would you like to field that one? Uh, we did not include it PET studies because, because the research gap in the literature mostly lies in, in new MRI um, based perfusion studies. And considering that there is um, PET studies. Um, going back um, until uh, 1970 or something, that would have been a lot of um, studies, which for the most part have already been uh, included in other systematic review, just like the one uh, from Hill or, uh, or Sukuma, uh, who already uh, uh, reviewed that, uh, that work and, and, and proposed findings. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, Kathy Davies. She's wondering about the perfusion talk, um, whether the hype, or unless you want to ask her a question. Okay. Uh, so whether uh, the hypercapnia MRI causes significant anxiety and whether patients with psychosis or at clinical high risk find it tolerable. Um, going through uh, an MRI acquisition is, is uh, anxiogenous enough. Um, adding to that, uh, the hypercapnia challenge is also um, a source of uh, anxiety for uh, participants uh, and not only, um, only patients with psychosis. So in order to uh, 
uh, approach that issue, uh, there will be a lot of training do um, before the acquisition with uh, the Park Avenue Challenge, so they can see it's not as bad as they uh, imagine, and that they can um, um, go through it uh, without uh, suffocating or anything. So um, yeah, there will be a, a great uh, amount of effort put to uh, reassure participants all along their uh, participant in the, their participation in that uh, study so um, so to 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 maintain uh, our participants in, uh, in the study uh, and prevent dropping out thanks are there other questions or comments Okay, so we can end it a little early today then, if there's no other comments or questions. I'd like to thank all the speakers on behalf of uh, everybody here for your great presentations and sharing with your work. And uh, we'll see you all next week.